Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study. We've, we're we're post-tribulational now. We've moved past the tribulation, and uh, now we're going to get into something else. And as I was studying this out and put this together, um, I, I want to do something a little different today. And uh, I, have, I have three pages of notes here on one subject. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this up in, in about 30-minute segments, and we'll just kind of see how, how many it takes us. We'll get this all out uh, you know, at the same time so you can watch uh, all three of the Bible studies. But I want to I wanna keep moving in this or else it would take us forever just to get out of one verse or chapter one or whatever. Uh, and, and I made that, made that commitment that once we started this thing, we was going to dig out everything that I knew to dig out out of the Bible, uh, which is what makes it interesting. I could just come in here and just read chapter one and say, okay, God bless you. Um, but anyway... Um, but I, I was reading it, going over this, and looking at uh, uh, the, uh, verse ten, and it just kind of uh, it just kind of jumped out at me, and I thought, you know, I want to cover this. We actually covered this uh, this this um, this word. Uh, on, on a video called The Trumpets. It was part of the Understanding Prophecy series. And if you, if you want to know kind of how I do things, um, this is the process that I think I see in the scriptures, that you understand how God speaks. Number one, God speaketh once, yea, twice. And so we have the words of the prophets here, like Amos, and understanding that they had a partial fulfillment. Um, i give you just a brief, brief, teeny tiny example of that. A partial fulfillment and a perfect fulfillment uh, in the last days. Where in Joel chapter uh, 2 verse 28, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Okay, so that was prophesied. Um, <clears throat> and he said along the same lines, he said, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And uh, that was quoted in Acts chapter 2, but not everything that Peter even mentioned. In fact, he cut this off in mid-sentence. Okay, you stop quoting here in mid-sentence and mid-verse here. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's important to take note of uh, because the, God speaketh once, yea, twice in a dream and a vision. And here's the dreams and visions right here. If you, uh, like me, I asked God for a dreams and visions ministry. And boy, did I ever get one. I'm reading all these dreams and visions and I'm going, this is really cool, you know. So I don't need to, you know, dream up stuff to talk about during the day. I have a sure word of prophecy right here. Uh, but anyway... Uh, not everything that Joel said was going to happen happened on the day of Pentecost. Uh, did, so does that make it irrelevant? Does that mean that, well, that's in the group of apocalyptic language. You know, he was just speaking that way to give a generalization of a so-and-so. No, it hasn't happened yet, okay? but it's going to. So that's how you understand the prophets. And then we have the, um, the uh, what was next? Uh, the, the, the understanding of the prophets. Uh, God speaketh one shade twice. Uh, Bible numerics is very, very important. Learn the numbers. Okay, Learn the numbers. Get our book, The King James Code, and By Divine Order, uh, the videos we've produced so far. Get those and uh, just kind of read from the Bible what the numbers mean and how they're applied. So when you see 5 or 50 or 500 or 5,000, how many did Jesus feed, there's a reason why that's there. When you learn that, then you, then you kind of understand it. Um, there is the uh, oh typology, Bible typology, and I uh, talked about it. I think in the in the clouds video or one of the two. I get them mixed up. Anyway, we have a video called the trumpets, and I deal with either with typology or the apocalyptic language of the scriptures. I think it's I think it's the trumpets where I deal with typology, uh, and this word trumpet is very, very important. Uh, to, to If we're going to have an, a mind frame that is the mind frame of the Bible, um, the, the miracle of this, of this whole thing is that God did not leave it up to the quote-unquote biblical language experts to tell you what they want you to hear. He translated the Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, the three unknown tongues... Okay, 1 Corinthians 14. The three unknown tongues, you can't even read the alphabets, and God, they, they spoke in order, and then God allowed one to translate what it is that they said. So this Bible, this Bible is the one translation of all three of those unknown tongues. And so what you get then 
is you get a consistency, a consistent flow throughout the scripture since it's all the same language. It was all translated by the same, by the same men at the same time. It, it, it's, it's perfect. I can't, I can't say it any better than that. It is perfectly written. And we're going to study this word trumpet and sort of get, get our prophetic bearings to see. Let me read this verse. Because I want you to understand this. He said, verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. We dealt with this idea of tribulation and persecution, which John, I mean, he knew all about it. He said, look, they fried me in oil. Okay? And uh, God brought me through it. So I'm, I'm going to be your brother during all this. So then he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, that does not mean that he was laying on the floor, uh, humping the air and barking like a dog, like you see at the Pensacola outflooring, out, outflooring, at the Pensacola outpouring, the Toronto blessing. Um, who, Todd Bentley did not come and kick him in the stomach and lay him out. Uh, Benny Hinn didn't blow on him. That's not what happened. When you're in the spirit, okay, and it's real simple. Everybody wants to make this some big, oh, mystical, oh, he's in the spirit. Like, like he was floating in air, okay, or in a trance. And, you know, his eyes rolled back, vomiting stuff. That's not what was going on. He was in the spirit, which means, he, more, number one, he was probably fasting, okay, and he was doing it on the Lord's day. He was probably fasting. He'd probably set this day aside and he said, this is going to belong to the Lord right here. So he's probably fasting. Uh, number two, he was probably reading the scriptures that he had. Okay, it may, may have been just the old day. He may have had some letters of Paul. I mean, by this time, everything had been written except the book of Revelation. Um, so he was reading this. I want to tell you something. You want to be in the spirit, read the spiritual book, read the Bible. And, and number two, uh, number three, okay, three, as above, so below. Uh, the number three, uh, he, was, he was probably praying a lot, okay? He was just spending a day, and I, I've, you know, I've, I've had a, you know, my morning uh, basically consisted of, I did some uh, radio broadcast with Southwest Radio this morning, and then I spent, you know, the, the, the rest of the morning just praying and reading my Bible and praying and reading my Bible, and I'd read some more, and then it, God, would, God would deal with me, and then I'd stop, and then I'd pray for a while. And uh, I don't, I've never been more in the Spirit than that. That's about all the Spirit that I can handle. But um, it was a, just a nice time of fellowship between me and my friend, my Lord Jesus Christ. And um, so it's, it, it's not because he was this exalted apostle, this guru, and he had these special powers, and he could, you know, this and that and the other. Just being, just be in the spirit. Okay, um, if if God requires fasting, then fast. Um, but you can be in the spirit by be reading the Bible and praying, and reading the Bible and praying, and just spending that time with God. And you give God your petitions, and then let God speak to you through the pages of the Word. Okay, so that's that's what I think he was doing here. So he was in. He said, "I was in the spirit on the Lord's day." And, uh, and and I'll also say this too. <clears throat> I just got off the phone with somebody today, and uh, they were telling me, you know, we're trying to work on something, and they said, um, you know, we don't, we can't find a church in our area. And I hear that, I hear that every week from people, and I feel sorry for people. I really do because I mean, I can find a church every week, okay? Um, but if you can't find a church, if you can't find a local congregation that you can fellowship with in, in clear conscience and whatever. Um, there's no excuse for you wasting the Lord's day, okay? And whatever whatever day you want to pick, okay? There's no excuse for you wasting that. Uh, have some family time, have some Bible time, some prayer time, uh, you know, devotional or whatever. And, uh, you know, whatever, whatever we're able to provide you with, uh, you know, our DVDs or CDs or, you know, these Bible studies, then, then let that be added to it. But anyway, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me, a great voice as of a trumpet. Okay? And um, he says in verse 12, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, 
and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot. He wasn't wearing shorts and a Hawaiian t-shirt and flip-flops. Okay? Um, he, with, a, with a garment, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. And the rest of the symbolism I want to get into, oh, I want to get into this so bad, but we're going to wait and deal with this trumpet issue. And, I want, and this is Jesus Christ, okay? This is the, uh, he said, fear not, I am the first or the last. Okay, so we know that this was Jesus. And um, he is appearing now to John. And he's going to give the, he's going to give the, the seven letters and he's going to give the final revelation uh, to John. And then the last remarks, okay? But anyway, he, he's praying, he's in the spirit, he's, God is dealing with him. Um, you know, he's not watching Jerry Springer on television. He's not listening to Willie Nelson in his iPod. He is in the spirit, he's denying his flesh, and he's in the spirit. So here Jesus shows up, and he shows up behind him, and he speaks to him in that great voice as of a trumpet. Now, I, I'm one of these that I'm going... Why did he have to mention that? Why did, why did he say that particular thing? Because I see the Bible as this clue book. It's going to help us put everything together. So let's look at trumpet. And, and what I do is, is really simple. I just look in the Bible for the occurrences of the word trumpet or trumpets or a trump. And that's what we're going to do um, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to we're going to do this and move on. So, um, let's look at this this voice of the trumpet. Number one, so we've identified we identified the trumpet being sounded as the voice of Jesus Christ Himself, and that is very very important to remember. I've been I've been in a couple meetings where there was there was some of these uh, Christians, and I and I love them dearly. Uh, they sort of had this messianic Jewish influence on them. And, and before we would start the, the service, they would pull out this great big old long curly horn and go, woo, 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 you know, like that. And uh, that's, we're announcing the beginning of the service. Okay, all right, that's fine. You know, the Bible says blow the shofar. Well, the King James doesn't say shofar, it says trumpet. Uh, but anyway, uh, they said, well, blow this. Okay, blow this. But the real trumpet, the real trumpet, okay, is Jesus Christ. That's his voice, and we're going to put it in context. So, first place we're going to go, Exodus chapter 19. Let's turn there. And I, I just love, I love the symbolism that's in this story. Uh, Exodus 19. They, these are, this, is, this is when uh, Israel is about to meet God. Okay, and they meet God, and they don't like it. It's they say, God, please stop, stop talking to us. We can't handle this. Uh, so anyway, I'm in Genesis 19, Exodus chapter 19. <clears throat> I'll just read it from my notes here. The Bible says in verse 13 uh, concerning this is the mountain. Now there shall not in hand touch it, uh, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Think of that word stone. There's a there's an apocalyptic meaning behind that word. An apocalypse means revealed. That's all the word means. There's a, there's a, a revealed revelation meaning behind this behind being stoned. Uh, Jesus being the stone cut without hands in the book of Daniel chapter two. When someone when the law was in place and someone was to be stoned. For, for some sort of violation of the law back in the Old Testament, that, those stones, that's what they represent. They represent, number one, they represent Jesus Christ, the stone cut without hands. Number two, they also represent we then as lively stones in 1 Peter chapter 2, the, the, uh, the saints who come back with Jesus in Revelation 19. Uh, used to be shot through whether it be beast or man. Okay, beast is not always an earthly beast. So just kind of think about the language. Uh, it shall live, shall not live. Now this is they're gathering around Mount Sinai. Okay, the mount, mountain mountains are a picture of um, of kingdoms, like the kingdom of God or the high places like heaven. Okay. Then he said, when the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mountain. Okay, so it's a beckoning trumpet. It's calling his people. I want you to think about the symbolism here. Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against, there's, here's a phrase here, the third day. The third day is a time prophecy. And if you want to measure it from the time Christ came, I'll use my papers here. Okay, here's the, here's the time Christ came. That's the first day. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And then we have... 
the, the second day. Here's the first day. Here we have the second day. That's 2,000 years that have expired okay, since Christ came the first time. And now we're about ready to enter in the third day, which is the millennial reign of Christ. Okay, so he's given you a time prophecy here. Uh, be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. Be clean. Wear clean clothes. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning. A lot of things happen in the morning, which means that you ought not lay in bed till noon every day. Amen. Tell that to your kids, all right? Uh, that there were thunders. Now in Revelation chapter 10, we're going to see seven thunders. So kind of make a notation of that in your Bible. In Exodus chapter 19, verse, what are we in? 16, there were thunders and lightnings, okay? Uh, and a thick cloud, um, the, you know, the Lord comes in a cloud, a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud. And Now, well, let's put this together. Just Here we have the thick cloud. The day of the Lord um, is a day of darkness, a, doomy, a day of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. And, and that's what we dealt with in the video called the clouds. This idea of the clouds is Jesus comes in the clouds. He said, behold, I come in the clouds. I come in the clouds. When he left the earth, he left in a cloud. The two angels came and said this same Jesus okay so so come again in like manner so here we have a, a, a prophetic picture of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and his appearance the thick cloud and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud now I, I even look at words like this word exceeding here okay uh, exceeding when you ex when you exceed something let me Use a, I don't know. Here's here's the barrier. Okay, here's the barrier. When you exceed something, you go beyond the barrier. This this trumpet, and you know maybe I'm making too much of this, but remember there is beyond our three dimensional world. Beyond our three dimensional world, there's another dimension. Um, it's the fourth dimension. It's referred to in the Bible as the, the, the spiritual realm. It's where the principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. The city built four square. That's New Jerusalem. It's in heaven. Okay, God and the four beasts that suspend the throne of God on the firmament. That's a reference to the, to the fourth dimension. So this trumpet was not a, a 3D it was not an earth realm trumpet. It was a trumpet that was exceeding loud. It was beyond the barrier of what we experience in this earth. Uh, when, when, when the devil took Jesus up to a mountain, he took him up to an exceeding high mountain. In other words, it wasn't just the top of Mount Everest. It was exceeding high, a spiritual mountain, which is still real. Okay, um, It was a... It was a he took him into a dimension where literally Christ and Satan, and we don't understand this, but Christ and Satan could see all the kingdoms of the earth at, at the same time. Okay, So that's why it had to be an exceeding high mountain. So anyway, just one word just comes out and we go, oh wow, that's cool. All right. So anyway, so that all the people that was in the camp uh, trembled. Uh, that's because it was just not an earthly trumpet. Moses brought forth the people out of the camp. That's think of Moses representing the law. Okay, the law. Listen, when you're outside of the camp, Christ was crucified outside of the camp. He was like the goat that was taken, the sacrifice, on the outside of the camp. We then are to follow him out there. And that's where Golgotha was, the place of the skull. That's where the cross was. It was outside of the camp. And so watch this. Here it is, and it's just a practical idea for you. It's the law that led you outside of the camp to the cross. Okay? It was the it was your guiltiness under the law of God that led you outside of the camp uh, to where the cross is. And that's what this picture is. That's who what Moses represents. Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And uh, spring is in the air, and so is pollen. And a little pollen leaveneth the whole lump. All right. So anyway, that's why I'm this and that and the other. And it's got a little stuffiness up here. And they stood at the nether part of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake and God answered him by a voice. Uh, and the Lord came down. Look at that. Look at the imagery here. Now, right here, we have a third day prophecy. We have the uh, we have the we have the clouds. We have the trumpets, and and we have Moses bringing the people. And now we have the Lord coming down. Okay. So just think about that. 
Um, and the Lord, uh, the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai and the, on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. Now in verse 18 of that, and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, and when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. The phrase afar off, underline that one in your Bible. Okay, the phrase afar off usually I, I kind of see it as um, a, a time thing. Okay, Abraham in Genesis ch- chapter twenty-two, when he lifted up his eyes on the third day, he saw the place afar off. Well, you know what he was doing? He was looking toward Mount Calvary, and he was not only looking visually toward Mount Moriah, but he was looking prophetically to that you know which is going to come and it came 2000 years on the third day literally after Mo, after Abraham offered up his only begotten son Isaac I, I just I love the I love the language of the King James it's so beautiful and so perfect uh, Peter said and I think it was in first Peter he said if you if you, uh, I can't I'm going to paraphrase he said if you don't read the Bible and you don't study the scriptures and put these things in remembrance then you won't be able to see afar off Okay? This book of prophecy here will help you see into the future. And the future that I want to see is, I, I, the future I want to see is Mike Hoggard not in hell. That's the future that I want to see. And that's what this Bible brings to the table. All right? Anyway. Uh, and they said to Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. Folks, you need to get this. Okay? Um, boy, I tell you what, it, we, we may be, I may be here till midnight tonight. Uh, but anyway, they, they said that they were asking for a mediator, someone to speak for God. Because th- when God spoke, it messed them up. In fact, they said, stop. Stop talking. Stop saying that. Stop talking to us, God. You're going to kill us. It's just like Moses being in the presence of God in Exodus 33. Moses said, Lord, let me see, let me see your face. And God said, you, know, you, you can't handle the face. Okay? Um, and so he let him see his back parts, the 33 bones of his spinal column. Exodus 33, he was looking at, he was looking at Jesus, to whom the whole body fitly framed together. Okay? That's like the bone structure of the temple. I love this. I'm having so much fun today. But anyway, so God was establishing the, the doctrine of the office of a mediator. You cannot listen to me. You cannot speak to God directly but through the mediator, Jesus Christ. And so two things. Number one, in the, in the Masonic Lodge, they will pray. They'll pray to the great architect. They'll pray to God, this God thing, the one who's in heaven above. They'll, they'll say all these nice words, but they ref- and they'll close the prayer, amen. They will not, they will not pray in the name of the, of the one mediator, Jesus Christ. They will not use his name. You know what that tells me? They're trying to bypass Jesus and go to God directly. And they believe that their works of self-righteousness is what allows them to do that. That is not true. Um, similarly, any religious service, and you know how nowadays we're seeing all this ecumenical stuff move in. I, you know, maybe every now and then a pastor might be praying. A good pastor might be praying, and, and he just, you know, it he, it may just kind of slip his mind, you know, about how to close a prayer. But I'll tell you, I think there's some rascals out there that are praying to God in the name of God, but they will not mention Jesus Christ. Now I'll tell you something: if you're not praying through the mediator, you're not praying. Okay, you're not praying to the right God. The other part of it is this: I this contemplative prayer business where everybody they're they're telling everybody the false doctrine that if they'll go into this little light trance and look inside of them and hear from the inside of them they can they can hear directly and speak directly to God who is inside of them that is also praying to God without a mediator okay and I'll tell you something I I'm glad that I have an advocate with my father Jesus Christ the righteous I I do wow I do not want to meet God without the mediator. I don't, I don't want to hear his voice, anything like that. And so watch this, okay? Here, here's what's happened. Um, in order, to, in, in order to, to downplay the scriptures, you'll hear, you'll hear all the preachers talking about salvation being of Christ, salvation being of this, salvation being of that. And when you start getting particular about your stand on the Bible, they'll say, well, you know, God's not bound by a book. You know, God, God, God's salvation, we're not saved by, you know, the Bible, we're saved by God, okay? Um, 
they will downplay this book. And I would tell you that if you want to hear from God, it's not your pastor. It's, it's not me either. You want to hear from God? It, here's the mediator right here. Here is what is speaking to you in the place of God. It is his word. It is his written word here in this Bible right here. And, and God was establishing that. So I just you know, want to throw that in there. But let not God speak with us lest we die. And so the establishment of a mediator right here uh, through the pages of the Bible uh, I think is very important. But this whole, this whole scenario here where they were brought the first time to Mount Sinai and they said, God, stop. Okay, So God stopped. I believe that they're going to come again. God's going to gather them once again in the last days. And when the trumpet sounds okay, and the cloud comes down and the Lord comes down from the mountain, I believe they're going to be gathered to him, to him one of these days. And that is God's people, Israel. Now, let's, uh, let's move along here. Leviticus 25. Um, Verse 9, here we have the establishment of the, uh, where God said we're going to make a couple of trumpets here out of silver. He said, Leviticus 25, 9, then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee. What is the Jubilee? The Jubilee is every 50 years. There's a number there. Okay, understand the numbers. There were 50 of the sons of the prophets that were, that were there with Elijah and Elisha when Elijah was taken up into heaven by a whirlwind. And Elisha remained, he had the double outpouring, he had the double mantle, okay, the double spirit. There were 50 of the sons of the prophets there on the day of Pentecost, um, it, which is 50 days, they heard the sound of the rushing mighty wind, and that's when the spirit c came down upon them, so that it's all going to happen again according to the numbers, okay? And I believe that's a time prophecy, and we hopefully will get to that before actually the time prophecy happens, okay? Uh, but anyway... The Jubilee year was if you had lost the inheritance. Or right now, Israel has lost the inheritance. Okay, All through the Bible, that's what you see. Now, Israel has lost the inheritance. And at the, at the Jubilee year, which is the 50th year, doesn't matter who had it, doesn't matter how bad in debt they were, doesn't matter if they were slaves or whatever, in the 50th year, they was to get it all back. Okay? That God's provision for even when we're in debt. Listen, think about that. Even when we're in debt, and we, I guarantee you, you live as long as I am, 44 years old. I've been all my life writing checks in my flesh that I cannot cash. Okay? I, am, I was spiritually bankrupt before God. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. That was me. Uh, for theirs is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, I will inherit the entire kingdom though I am bankrupt and somebody had to pay my bills for me, and that was Jesus Christ. So that's what the Jubilee year is all about. It has everything to do with the restoration of the inheritance to Israel. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month on the day of atonement. The tenth day, the seventh month, uh, the day of atonement, shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. So... Here's, here's what I'm, I want you to kind of think along these lines. We have going to unfold for us in Revelation 8 and 9, when the seventh seal opens, then seven trumpets are going to, are going to sound. Okay, uh, it's, it's a trumpet that we're waiting to hear as far as being taken up and being translated from this earth, from this body, to become the, the new body of Jesus Christ to appear at his second coming. And so just kind of Think about all these now, okay? because this trumpet sounding has everything to do with us being gathered to Christ, and it has everything to do with the restoration to Israel. Uh, shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land? You shall hollow the 50th year, there it is, and proclaim liberty. Paul said, there, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. So this word liberty is a gospel word. It, when you're liberated, you're saved. Okay, I don't care if they throw you in a prison, a gulag, if they beat you every day, it doesn't matter. When you are saved, you are liberated. We just released uh, the video, the Statue of Liberty, and uh, the, that's a false liberty, people. They're, they're, the masonry is all about the liberty of mankind, freeing them from the yokes of bondage. Well, the yoke of bondage to them is that we're not, we can't become gods. And so they, this idea that they teach is that if we become gods, we'll be free from all of our vices. We'll have a new world where everything will be peace and harmony. We'll be like animals. 
literally. Okay, that's the that's the liberty that they're promising. Proclaim liberty throughout all the land and to all the inhabitants thereof, and it shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man into his possession, and you shall return every man into his family. God's going to bring the tribes back together again, and so that's going to be an anticipation of Revelation chapter 7. Now Numbers chapter 10 verse 2. Um, make thee two trumpets of silver. Okay? Just stop and look at the words and think of verses. Okay? Two trumpets. Okay? Old Testament and New Testament. Those are the two trumpets. It's silver because Psalm 12, the 490th chapter of the Bible, 70 times 7, Psalm 12 says the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace, furnace of earth purified seven times. Okay? King James Bible, 1604 to 1611. That's one, two, three, four, six, seven years. Okay? Purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Okay? And the word of God is Christ. It is us. I mean, it, it, we're all, it all encompasses that. And that's what that is. So it says, make thee two trumpets of silver. Okay? That means that you're going to have a King James Bible. Okay? I, I, mean, I love it. Uh, of a whole piece shalt thou make them. Okay? A whole piece. A whole piece of silver. That means they're all one. And of the same. One language. Okay? Um, of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly <clears throat> and for the journeying of the camps. And so, the two trumpets of silver, which is the word of God in one language, okay, made out of one piece of one language, they're very, very important. And uh, I have something, I think I'm going to wait until the, yeah, I'm going to wait and we're going to cut it off here and we're going to take a little break and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll keep going through this trumpets deal uh, because I, I want to get through this and I want to lay this as a foundation so we won't have to go back and deal with it when we're looking at um, the seven trumpets in Revelation chapter 8 and 9. And so uh, I'm going to cut it off here. Uh, and I'm going to, in the next Bible study, we're going to be talking about a false trumpet. Okay? What do you think that's made out of? Um, but anyway, the, the trumpets are going to sound. The two trumpets of the Word of God are going to sound. And Israel is going to be, they're going to come back together into the assembly. They're going to be assembled together. He's going to gather his people together. Um, he's going to gather us unto him to be his body. And then he's going to gather the, the 12 tribes of Israel back together uh, as a complete nation again. Anyway, uh, that is phase one of our study on the trumpets. Uh, we'll continue this in the next Bible study. God bless you.